All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and so thankful for who you are, your goodness towards us, Lord. And so we worship you, we exalt you, we glorify you. And so tonight, even as we come to study your word, Lord, we ask that we just prayed earlier that you would minister to us. Your word is so sweet, as we're going to talk about tonight. Your word is sweeter than honey. <laughs> and so, Lord, we want to feast on your word tonight. And we want to be sustained by your word tonight. And so, God, we turn over this hour to you. May you be glorified in it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Welcome to those of you joining us on Zoom. I saw some of you, uh, the names, I don't get to see everybody, but I, I know some of the uh, people on the Zoom call. And, and so uh, it's a blessing always to have you join us um, and to be blessed by the word of God. And it's good to have Pastor Drew in the room tonight. <laughs> I know. I know. Stay warm. <laughs> Blessing. See you. So we are picking up where we left off last week, of course. And I didn't fix it again. It's <laughs> verse 1 through 1. It should say verse 1 through 11. Sorry about that. I, I made the mistake. It's exactly. So long as it's correct on your notes, I made that mistake last week, and for whatever reason, I zoned out again and um, and didn't see to fix it this time. So you know, I am fallible as opposed to being infallible. <laughs> so yes, all right. So we are in chapter ten. We started off last week uh, looking at the second interlude. This is kind of the the second interlude between uh, the uh, the seven trumpets, uh, the the blowing of the seven trumpets, and between the sixth trumpet and the seventh trumpet blowing, there is this interlude, kind of like what we saw with the breaking of the seven seals. And so this is where we're at. So last week, as I mentioned, I attempted, I wanted to get through the first seven verses didn't happen. We only got through five verses. <laughs> so uh, we're going to pick up tonight from verse six. So the division doesn't quite break down as you see it here in terms of number one and number two, but oh well. I mean, we're going to cover all of it as we go through. All right, so let's get into the text, right? So this is what we covered last week. He says, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven he was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Now, I want you to keep this, um, this portion in mind, verse four here. Um, that way it says, do not write what the seven thunders said, because I'm going to come back at the end and talk a little bit more about that. I know I talked about it last week, uh, but basically we don't know what the seven thunders said. <laughs> right it, it's a mystery right he says the seven thunders spoke he's about to write it down and the voice says nope sorry don't write it down uh seal it up um and do not write it down so it's a mystery we'll come back to it all right so we'll pick up tonight from verse five i said we did the first five actually we did the first four right so i'm gonna pick up from verse five tonight then the angel I had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven, and he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, there will be no more delay, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants the prophets." Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it 
it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. All right, so this is a very interesting passage, of course. I mean, this is a continuation of John's vision. As I mentioned last week, John is no longer in heaven. Now he's back down on earth, right? And so after the brief reference to the seven thunders, like I mentioned just a minute ago, now John's attention now turns back to this mighty angel that he sees standing with one foot in the sea and one foot on the earth, right? And it says that the angel raises his right hand to heaven, right? Um, obviously, that is where God lives. That is God's abode, right? Isaiah 57, 15 talks about that. And he solemnly swears, right, um, that the period of delay is over. By the way, Isaiah 57, 15 says, I live in a high and if well, let, let me back up a little bit. He says, for this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever whose name is holy, I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. So yes, God lives in heaven, but he also lives with us. Uh, but if he raises his hand, right hand to heaven, solemnly swearing that the time of delay is done. The time of delay is over. And then of course, as he says, with the sounding of the seventh trumpet that will come later on, God's purpose, God's great purpose in creation and redemption is going to be brought to an end, is going to be brought to a completion, right? So essentially what we're seeing here, ladies and gentlemen, is kind of like, you know, you hear people say the beginning of the end, <laughs> right? It's kind of now things are going to begin to move towards the end of time and in the end of days. But well, let's talk about this swearing of the oath, lifting his right hand. With the, in the Old Testament, lifting your right hand. Now, a lot of people wonder, like you go to court, right? If you're going to be, a, uh, you know, a, a witness in court, or if you're giving a deposition or whatever, you know, you have to put your, your hand on the Bible, raise your right hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, right? And you wonder, well, where does that come from? Like, where did we, when did we start doing that, right? Well, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. That's how far back. So you're talking at least four to 5,000 years, people have been swearing with their right hand to heaven, right? And so the, in the Old Testament, we see this. So for example, in Genesis, uh, none other than Abram himself, right, takes an oath, right? And he declined the spoils of battle saying, he says, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal. And then later on in uh, Deuteronomy, in fact, I just read this, was it two days ago or so uh, in my Bible reading, uh, the Song of Moses, where God himself uh, lifts, up, lifts up his hand to heaven and he solemnly swears. Now, what's interesting is God tells you and, you and me that we shouldn't swear. <laughs> right? And the reason why we shouldn't swear, of course, we don't want to take his name in vain. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, we have no power to control anything. <laughs> right? Life itself is beyond our control. But God is the only one who controls all. <laughs> right? And so he can swear by himself. And so we see here that in the Song of Moses, that he, God lifts up his hand to heaven in a solemn oath to carry out vengeance on his adversary, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 40. So this whole aspect of swearing, like I said, goes back all that far into the Old Testament. But really, it is in Daniel chapter 12 that we find an interpretive background uh, for this particular um, text, right? So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, uh, let's turn over to uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, right? Uh, because this is where we see, again, Daniel, like I said last week, and Ezekiel as well, is kind of like a, com a companion text to Revelation in the sense that it's almost like the Old Testament version of, 
of Revelation, these two books, because they are both apocalyptic texts, right? And so Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, it says um, this, the man clothed in linen, meaning this angel that he saw, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven. So in the Daniel text, the angel actually lifts both hands, right? And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying it will be for a time, times, and half a time, right? Uh, so, which, by the way, is three and a half years. If you're wondering what time, time, and half a time is, it's three and a half years. So, there you can see that this man clothed in linen, he's above the water, he raises both hands, and he makes this solemn declaration, this solemn oath. And then, of course, he says, when the power of the holy people will finally be broken, right? Uh, and all these things will be completed. Right. So this is the text that essentially kind of mirrors what we're reading in this verse here in Revelation chapter uh, 10, verse five. So the question is, in apocalyptic context, right, uh, again, we're talking about apocalyptic literature here. And now for those of you, maybe for, th for this text, I mean, this word is new, the word apocalypse right? Apocalypse, you may have heard the word apocalypse, and a lot of times in our modern English, we use the term apocalypse to mean like a disaster, right? Or you say like, oh my gosh, it was an apocalypse. Well, really, that's not what the word means, right? The word apocalypse means revelation. In fact, the book itself literally is called apocalypse. So we can call it the book of apocalypse, the book of revelation, right? So when we talk about apocalyptic texts, in the Bible, like Daniel, like Ezekiel, like Revelation, we're talking about these texts that have a sense of revelation or give insight or revelation, especially to the last days. And in apocalyptic thought, the question that is often at hand or that is concerned with apocalyptic literature is how long until the end? <laughs> when will the end take place, right? And of course, in Daniel, uh, one of the angels here uh, addresses the man, again, clothed in linen with the query, how long will it be for, before these astonishing things are fulfilled, right? So you can see this in Daniel chapter 12, verse 6. One of, one of them said to the man clothed in linen, who is above the world, how long, how long would it be before these things happen, right? And since that time, and one could say maybe since time immemorial, <laughs> People have always wondered, how long is it going to be? When will the end come? How will the end come? What will happen? By the way, that's one of the reasons why the book of Revelation has so much interest in the church, so much curiosity in the church, right? Um, you know, the moment you say, I'm going to be teaching on Revelation, oh, boom, everybody's like, I want to, I want to be there because everybody wants to know <laughs> what is going to happen in the end. Right. And then, of course, we fast forward to the book of Revelation in chapter six, verse 10. You remember the martyrs that are under the altar. Right. They're asking a similar question. How long, O Lord? Right. Until you vindicate us. Right. We covered this uh, way back when. But in. Yeah. So in chapter six, verse 10, uh, the martyrs, it says they called out in a loud voice. How long, sovereign Lord? holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood, right? And now the answer to that question comes. And the answer is no more delay. There will be no more delay, right? And now it's about to happen. Like I said, it's the beginning of the end that is about to be unrolled here. Now, in terms of understanding this statement, there will be no more delay. How can we understand this, right? Now, the, 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 the thing here is that some early commentators um, and interpreters of this text, they interpret this statement as a, almost like a, what I call metaphysical assertion. Metaphysical, what does that mean? Metaphysical has to do with time and space, right? Time and space, we all live in time and space, <laughs> right? Um, I always tell my students, when you think of time and space, go back to your childhood, when your parents were telling you a story. There once was a person, whatever, who lived in a land, you know, once upon a time, who lived in a land far, far away, <laughs> right? It's time and space. 
once upon a time in a place, right? So we all live in a time and space. But the problem here is when you interpret this text in a metaphysical sense, you run into a problem because the assertion is that there is a sequence of events that are about to unfold. And is that the way it will happen? Right. So, for example, the translation of the uh, amplified version of this text says there shall be time no longer. Right. That's the way amplified version translate this text. So instead of saying there will be no more delay, it says that there shall be time no longer. And that obviously reflects that that interpretation of the metaphysical, like I said, the time and space interpretation. I don't, be, I don't necessarily think that is the meaning of time here in this particular case. By the way, the word time in Greek is chronos, right? Chronos, and that's where we get the, the word chronological, right? Meaning time, right? Um, and that's the word that is used here in, in terms of delay. The word translated in English delay, that will be no, no more delay, is the word chronos. Uh, so I guess literally you could say there shall be no more time or there will be no more time, um, but it will, I don't think it, it will be necessary for an angel to put himself under oath just to make this assertion that, the, you know, that eternity is timeless. I, I, you know, you know, I swear by heaven and earth that eternity is timeless. I don't think that's what the angel is getting at there. Right? I think the angel is getting at a little bit more than just saying that eternity is timeless. I think here that the announcement of no further delay uh, is something deeper. Uh, first of all, number one, I think the announcement of no further delay comes obviously as welcome news to those martyrs and to those that are suffering. Right. That's the first thing. The martyrs under the altar, they've been waiting. They have sacrificed their lives. They have given all. And they had been told, if you get, if we go back to Revelation chapter six, they had been told to wait, wait for a little while, rest a while until the full number, it says, of their fellow servants and brothers and sisters should be put to death. <laughs> right. So essentially, God is telling the, the martyrs, hey, wait, don't, 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 you know, don't become too anxious. <laughs> there are more like you who will suffer. More will be put to death, right? And then, of course, we have the seven thunders. The seven thunders would have been involved in another delay, yet another delay, right? That, of course, that delay had been canceled as we just read. So now nothing stands in the way of the final unfolding, the final dramatic period of human history that is about to take place here. Right. So in a sense, I don't think delay should be and should not be understood uh, as a postponement, but more or less that God controls everything. <laughs> right. God controls time and eschatological. In other words, end time events will happen according to his plan and in his schedule and according to his schedule, essentially. Right. So that is essentially what I I guess at least that's kind of how I. I see it, right? So John's point in, in is that the prayers of the saints, right? These martyrs for final vindication await no further delay, that God is about to bring the judgment, right? The judgment is about to come, right? Um, and, and that the, the final vindication, hey, good to see you, Eric. The final vindication is about to be unfolded here. And this is the encouragement to all of us who are believers, right? And that's why I say the book of Revelation is really all about uh, encouragement to the church of all time, past, present, and future should Jesus tarry, right? That especially this section that we're dealing with, the interludes, especially the interludes, that they are an encouragement to us that no matter what we go through, no matter how hard the trials, no matter how hard the sufferings, no matter what we go through, the persecutions, that there is going to come a time when there will be no more delay. There will be no more carrying on of the suffering, that God will bring it to an end and that he will vindicate his own, that he will come to the defense of his own, those that he has called his own people, his own special people, right? 
So we can take that encouragement to heart. And so from this point on, right, nothing stands between that, right? Nothing stands to, between God's uh, judgment and his vindication of his people, right? God will not intervene to give humanity further opportunity to repent. Because you remember with the blowing of the seven trumpets, right, the six trumpets, that God was giving humanity time to repent. <laughs> and you remember how chapter 9 ended, verse 20 and 21? No repentance, no turning around, right? Even though they had seen all of the woes, they had seen all of the things, the, the, the plagues that had been poured out, a third of humanity had been wiped out from these plagues, no repentance. So why, why continue just, you know, going on like that? So that's pretty much brings that to an end, right? So all restraint is now going to be removed. And then from this point on, now we're going to begin to see, like I said, the beginning of the end. Things are start, the, 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 the escalation of the severity of the, of the, of the judgment is going to take a, a, a steep, you know, increase, right? So we're going to see the Antichrist is going to be revealed pretty soon. <laughs> He's going to come on the stage. The man of lawlessness, right, is going to be revealed, right, as we read uh, in 2 Thessalonians. Let's go ahead and quickly look at 2 Thessalonians. For those of you not familiar with this, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, it talks about this. It says, um, and not to become easily unsettled and alarmed by some prophecy. Um, when, when am I reading? Am I reading this correctly? Sorry. Reading the wrong verse. Uh, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, like I said, the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God, <laughs> right? So that is the Antichrist, and we're going to see him show up on the scene in, in, in short order, right? And so then, of course, the forces of God and Satan are going to meet in that final battle, that final confrontation that will take place, right? So this, of course, is going to be the time of distress as the Bible says in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, the time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of the nations, right? And of course, Jesus repeats that in the synoptic gospels. By the way, again, if you're wondering what that word synoptic gospels mean, the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? The word synopsis or synoptic means same or similar. Right. So when you go back and look at Matthew, Mark and Luke in terms of their their outline or the way they tell the gospel story, there is much overlap. In fact, Bible uh, scholars believe that all three of those gospels have the same source to some degree, and they believe it is Mark. Right. To some degree. Um, and so that's why they are called synoptic gospels. John, obviously, is a different it's it's it, his his style of writing and his emphases are different from those other three. But in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, uh, we see that Jesus talks about this time of tribulation that will come, right? The time of distress. He says, for men, there will be, for, from then, excuse me, there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again, right? And he says the same thing in, in Mark chapter 13, verse 19, where he says, because of the, those days, because those would be days of distress unequaled from the beginning when God created the world until now and never will be equaled again. So this will be a time of immense and intense persecution, tribulation. Some have called this the great tribulation. Um, it is going to be a dark time, <laughs> right? A time of suffering, a time of persecution, a time of trials. I mean, you name it. But as we know, as the saying goes, it is the darkest before the dawn. 
because Jesus obviously is going to show up on the scene, right? But it will be a time of uh, an awesome period of Satan's wrath, right? Because he knows his days are short. His time is coming to an end. So he's going to unleash everything that he has on the world during those days, using the Antichrist, using the false prophet, as we're going to be seen in the next, uh, in the upcoming chapters, right? But so the appointed delay is now over. The period of the end is now, like I said, is irrevocably set in motion. And that's what begins now. So also it's worth noting here that the angel describes God when he takes the oath as the one who lives forever and ever. Now, we can read this and just skip over it, but that is so important to, in fact, in terms of what I just said <laughs> about what is about to be unleashed, right? God is the one who lives forever. And we see this designation of him being the one who lives forever being repeated over and over in Revelation, for example, in chapter one, chapter four, chapter 15, and so on. And I think it is especially appropriate uh, in the context of the impending martyrdom, <laughs> right? The impending suffering and trials and persecution that so many of these believers, especially in Asia Minor at the time uh, that were, they were about to endure. And even in our day or even in the future where believers might endure these things, the, 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 the martyrdom and persecution and all these things that the church will be called upon to sacrifice, to sacrifice their very lives out of faithfulness to Christ, that only a God, and I want you to hear this very clearly, that only a God who lives forever and ever, who lives for eternally, right, who lives beyond the threat of death itself, right, can promise them life, can promise you and I life. I want, I want that to sink in a little bit because a, a God who, who is touched by death cannot promise you life, right? And that, and, and that is the, and we just talked about this, Pastor Drew alluded to the fact that we're coming up to Easter. Today is, you know, you know for those of those celebrate Ash Wednesday and, and we're starting the, the Lent season and all of that. The whole point is we're going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, <laughs> right? Jesus, as he says in Revelation, he is the one who lives forever. He was dead, but now he's alive, <laughs> right? So he is, a, he is the God who cannot be touched by death. And the reason, just again, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 15, where he outlines the power of the resurrection. At the end, he says, where will death is your sting? Where will grave is your victory? Because Jesus has conquered death, right? He has defeated death. He, is, he has the keys of death and hell itself in his hands. And so when he says to the, to the martyrs, be encouraged. I am the one who lives forever and ever, right? And so therefore he's assuring us that, hey, look, if I am not touched by death, you will not be touched by death too. That even though you may die physically, you will live eternally, right? Because he is the one who is the eternal God. We worship and serve a God who is eternal. And so when the angel lifts his hand and says he swears by the one who lives forever and ever, that is, in fact, a major declaration, right? By the way, I can get into this point, but it, it you know maybe behooves to be said that all other prophets, Founders of religions are all dead. They are still in their grave, right? Uh, you know, Muhammad, still in the grave. Buddha, still in the grave, right? Um, I can't think of his name right now, but uh, 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 the guy who started Scientology, still in the, in the grave. L. Ron Hubbard, thank you. L. Ron Hubbard, still in the grave, right? All of these people are in the grave. They cannot promise eternal life. <laughs> but Jesus is alive. He is the only one that came back from the dead. And so he's giving this word as an encouragement to the church 
to say, yes, you may go through trials. You may go through suffering. Yes, you may even lay down your life in faithfulness to Christ. But he's the one who lives forever and ever. He is eternal. But God is not only eternal. Right? <laughs> he's not only eternal. He's the creator of heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is in it. <laughs> as the angel swears. Right? And we can go back and look at this in the Old Testament, in Exodus, in, in Nehemiah, in Psalms, and other passages. Right, So when we talk about this, when we speak of God as creator, again, it underscores, it emphasizes the, his power to accomplish what he sets out to do. He is the eternal God. He has created all things. He has created the entire universe. Right? He's created the entire universe. And so for, for John, this means that that he's the one who brought all things into being, right? But also he can carry out, he can carry them through to fulfillment for his redemptive purposes. God is at work. He's always at work. And so the end of history, as was at the beginning, is under his control, his sovereign control. And so this is what the encouragement that we see in the book of Revelation, that we have that assurance that God is in control. No matter how crazy things may look right now, no matter how things may be looking like they're spinning out of control in our world, in our country, in our whatever, right? God is in control. And we can rest with that assurance that he has our back, <laughs> as we say, right? All right, on to verse seven, right? So it says, when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, right? Um, so he says, but when, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his, his servants, the prophet. So the proclamation of the mighty angel is that there shall be no further delay, but now with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the hidden purposes of God will be, will be revealed or accomplished, right? So New King James Version translation says, when he is about to sound his trumpet. And that could mean, uh, you know, it could be taken to mean that the mystery of God will be completed before the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Maybe, right? Well, I believe here what is what the angel is saying here, however, I think is that within the period of time to be introduced by the seventh trumpet or the blowing of the seventh trumpet blast, the mystery of God will be brought to completion, I think is what is being declared here, right? Now, of course, a lot of attention has been given to the meaning of the mystery of God. What is the mystery of God, right? Well, let's take a look at some passages here. So for example, in Colossians chapter two, verse two, uh, the exact phrase is used to refer to, uh, to Christ. Christ is the mystery, right? It says in chapter two, verse two of Colossians, it says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, <laughs> namely Christ, right? So Christ is, in this case, the mystery of God in whom are the hidden treasures of all things. In Christ is hidden all of the wisdom, all of the knowledge of God, <laughs> right? And Paul, throughout his letters, those of you who were coming when, when I was teaching on the letters of Paul, you remember I talked a lot about the mystery of God because Paul talks about the mystery of God. And he says the mystery of God is Christ, the salvation that he has revealed in Christ, <laughs> right? So in that sense, that is the mystery of God. But of course, mysteries were secrets, things that were preserved in heaven and then revealed, right, uh, to us, revealed to a select few, perhaps, the wise and the righteous, right? God reveals it to them, especially those that are apocalyptic prophets, <laughs> right? Revelatory prophets, right? And so the idea is that God is uh, communicating to the prophets heavenly mysteries, things that are unknown, things that are hidden from us, right? Heavenly mysteries that will be understood when properly communicated and, of course, interpreted uh, according to his revelation, right? His apocalypse, if you want to use that term, right? So literally, the word mystery means secret, 
right? Secret, right? So the mysteries were secrets. That's essentially what he's talking about there. Now, one of the interesting things that we do see about the word um, mystery or the mysteries of God or secret is that there is an eschatological orientation. In other words, an end time, again, that word eschatology, eschatological means end times, right? So there's an end times orientation to the word mystery or secret that is always present in the New Testament, right? Uh -huh. Sorry, is someone's phone going. <laughs> oh, okay. So there's an there is always an there's always an eschatological component there, right? So for example, uh, in Romans chapter eleven, verse uh, twenty-five, we see that the final destiny of Israel is a mystery, right? Romans chapter 11, verse 25, it says this, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, right, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. So what he's saying here that there's going to come a time, again, this is all eschatological. In the end times, the destiny of Israel will be revealed. But right now, it's a mystery, right? And then we go to uh, 1 Corinthians 15 that I just referenced a few minutes ago, where Paul is talking about the resurrection. And in that chapter, uh, which is a great chapter, by the way, if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to read it. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about the resurrection and he's answering the questions of the, the Corinthian church that they had sent him about how will the dead be raised and when and how will the resurrection take place and all of these questions. And Paul gets to verse 55, where he says, where oh, death is your victory, where oh, uh, death is your sting, like I said earlier, uh, right? But in, 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 he goes on, he says, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, right? But he says all of this, how we will be changed is a mystery, <laughs> right? He said, it's a mystery. I says, you know, I don't know how it will happen, but it is a mystery that we, you know, that the, the corruptible will become incorruptible, right? The change that will overtake us when Christ returns. Right? He says, I declare to you a mystery. I don't know how it's going to happen. Right? And then, of course, in 2 Thessalonians, like I just read, the mystery of lawlessness, the man of lawlessness that will be revealed, right? In verse uh, seven, he talks about this. Right? He says, but we were, uh, but we were gentle among you, like, um, um, uh, um, excuse me, I'm reading 1 Thessalonians. I need to read 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, verse 7. And he says, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, or the mystery of lawlessness is at, already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. So again, it's all, he's saying that this, is, this mystery of lawlessness is already at present time being restrained and will soon be revealed, right? So again, this is, you know, there are certain things, as I would say at the end, there are certain things that are, un are, are unknown to us, <laughs> right? That we will not know on this side of heaven, right? Uh, so that is what's going to be to happen. But at the coming of Christ, all of those things, the lawlessness, all of that will be destroyed. So the mystery of God in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7 here, right? The mystery of God shares this apocalyptic outlook here, of course, in Revelation as well, right? We see this as well here. Um, so, and it refers to, it's talking about, in, in this case, the purpose of God as revealed, again, in the consummation of history, as all things come to an end, if you will. Right. As all things are coming to an end, God is going to reveal his purposes to us. Right. Um, and so, again, just like in these other passages that I just read, this concept of mystery is tied or tied in with 
the um, with eschatology, with the end, right? And so in the New Testament, in the New Testament, this divine purpose in history is a mystery, not because it is unknown in this particular case, but because it never would be have been known if God had not revealed it to us, right? In Christ, as I said, Christ has been revealed. Christ is the mystery. And so Christ has, uh, God has revealed that aspect of the mystery in Christ. And so John is saying that with the sounding of the seventh trumpet, that which God purposed in creation, that which God purposed at that beginning of time and made possible through the blood of the lamb, all of these things will be brought to fulfillment. So, this purpose, this what is this purpose that God wants to bring to fulfillment? And this is one of the things that I, I just find so amazing about this text. The, 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 the purpose that God wants to bring to fulfillment is his kingdom. His kingdom on, on, uh, to, to reign and to rule in his kingdom, right? And so that is the purpose, that this purpose is in fact the kingdom of God. We see this in Revelation chapter 11, verse 5, uh, uh, verse uh, 15, Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. So now we get to the seventh trumpet. I, I, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, <laughs> right? So the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. You see, that is the whole purpose. That's the mystery revealed, <laughs> that it's the kingdom of God has come. When Jesus came, what did he begin to preach? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. <laughs> that was what he was preaching, right? It was the mystery of God. That's why I said, Jesus is the mystery of God revealed. That is, Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. That is the mystery of God. The kingdom of God established. And the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He will reign forever and ever. Down through the centuries, whenever you pray the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. Your will be done. You're praying for the mystery of God to be revealed. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You're praying for the mystery of God. Matthew 6, 10, your kingdom come, your will be done. That's, the, that's, what, that's what that means in the prayer <laughs> when we pray the Lord's prayer, right? So may the kingdom of God come. Lord, let it come. Jesus come, establish your kingdom, as we will see, that is what he does, right? So from this point on, right, the drama has now moved to that moment, again, immediately now preceding this final scene. It's like I said, things are, you know, they're, they're, they're ramping up, so to speak, right? Things are moving quickly now. So from this point on now, the apocalypse, the, 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 the final moment, right, the revelation now becomes a multi-dimensional presentation of the final victory, the final triumph of God over evil. Now, why do I say multidimensional? Because you're going to be seeing it coming from all ends, <laughs> right? I, like I say there, any attempt to arrange this material in a strictly sequential or chronological order is doomed for failure. Because as I mentioned before, we're now, like, like the text says, we're outside of time and space. <laughs> We're not in a metaphysical universe anymore. <laughs> We're in God's zone. We're in God's space. And God dwells outside of time and space. So you're not going to be able to order things in sequence anymore, right? So from his vantage point, from his point in eternity, right, from the brink of eternity here, John is able to see, he unveils the evil forces that operate behind the scenes of history. What is going on behind the scenes in the last days and how those forces will mount a final furious assault, right, on the faithful. And that is what is coming up 
in chapter uh, chapter 12 that as we will see chapter 12 verse 12 verse 17 it you know things like i said things are going to go from bad to worse things are going to get bad like i said it's darkest before the dawn right and so in chapter 12 verse 12 we see he says therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you he is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He is going to go bizarre. He is going to go all out huh, because he knows his time is limited. So he's going to give it his all. You can't hold that back from. I mean, you know, you can't say the devil didn't give it at all. He, his all. He's going to give it his all. Right. And then verse 17, then the dragon was enraged. Of course, the dragon is Satan. He was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So it, the, the book is, a, is an encouragement, yeah, <laughs> but there are some times when it doesn't sound encouraging because he, he's saying, look, it's going to get bad. You're going to experience trials. You're going to experience suffering. You know, the devil is going to unleash everything he has on you, right? He's going to make war, as he says, that the dragon is going to make war. He's going to come against all those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So a persecution and martyrdom is about to be unleashed, will precede the seventh trumpet. The overthrow and the destruction, however, of the persecutors is also in the cards. And that includes the demonic powers, as well as those on earth that are operating with them. That would also follow because as we will see as we go on, when we get to chapter 16, the bowls of God's wrath will be unleashed, right? And of course, that is a final prelude to the final destruction of all evil. And then, of course the inauguration of eternity when we will be with Jesus forever and ever, right? So we have that to look forward to. So from the beginning, God, you know, the beginning from God, from the beginning has willed the complete and final defeat of evil. That has been the, God has always destined, has always, you know, to defeat evil. <laughs> and it should come as no surprise. Of course, the details have not been revealed in some cases. The substance has been made to God's people through the prophets, through John and others, right? So there's no reason why this designation should be limited, again, to either just the Old Testament or the New Testament prophets. All of the prophets are saying this, that eventually God will defeat evil, right? Even 700 years 700 years before Christ, the prophet Amos said this. He said this in Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plans to the, his servants, the prophets. So God is revealing to some degree some of the mysteries of his plan uh, to us. And of course, one purpose has run throughout history, and that is his intention, again, to, to save those that are his, and of course, to bring divine judgment on those that uh, you know, have been in rebellion to him. And so this is why the hidden purpose of God is said to have been the gospel of the prophets. All right, we go on to verse eight. So he goes on, he says, then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more, go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. All right, so this is a very short uh, um, verse. Uh, at the command uh, of the heavenly voice, John takes this, this little scroll uh, from the angel's hand, and it's very similar to what Ezekiel did. Like I said, Ezekiel is kind of like the companion or the, uh, the, the, um, the you know, the similar book uh, to Revelation in the Old Testament, right? And so the voice from heaven that told John to seal up the utterances of the seven thunders now speaks again, Right? Uh, and this time he's telling him to go and take the little scroll that lies open in the hand of the mighty angel. And like I said, it's very similar to what we see Ezekiel experiencing here in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9. He says that I looked 
and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, right? And which he unrolled before me on both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe, right? And so uh, the, the voice is the voice from heaven. And of course, that voice from heaven, it kind of underscores the authoritative nature of the command, right? John, of course, would be reluctant. I think he would have, it's unlikely that John would have approached the angel himself if he had not been commanded to. I know I wouldn't have. Uh, I mean, this is a mighty angel, right? Uh, but John approaches the angel based on this command. And notice that he says that the scroll in the hand of the angel lies open, right? Now, this is in contrast to the other scroll that we saw earlier uh, in chapter five that was sealed, <laughs> right? The seven sealed scroll, right? In chapter five that remained securely sealed and fastened until the lamb who was worthy to break open its seal to open that scroll. But the little scroll is permanently open in the hand of the angel. And the angel once again is described standing with one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. And we don't know why John keeps repeating this. Maybe he's just making the point uh, that this angel is a mighty angel, but he keeps repeating this. But probably the voice is the voice of Jesus, again, because I say this is an authoritative voice, right? And then we go on now to the last couple of verses, verse 9 and 10. He says, so I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll, and he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth, it will be as sweet as honey and so on. So he took it, he ate it. And of course, uh, it was um, sour to his stomach, but he says it was sweet as honey in my mouth, right? So in obedience, he does exactly what the, the, uh, the voice told him to do. He takes it and he's told to eat it and he eats it. Now, this is a little, again, it's a little strange. Like, you know, usually you don't eat books you know can you imagine trying to jump down on a book <laughs> it doesn't sound very appetizing right uh but he's told to eat it and so he starts eating it uh right but of course he is warned he's told that uh it will be sweet as honey in his mouth right but it will turn his stomach sour right um now, of course, John is now back on earth. Like I said, he's asking the angel to give him this scroll. He's not demanding it. He's not like, you know, snatching it out of his hand. Uh, but he is responding to what the voice tells him to do. Right. Now, what's interesting, again, we have to go back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter two, because Ezekiel was also told to do something very similar. Right. So turn with me again. Ezekiel chapter two, verse eight. Right. He says, but you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you, <laughs> right? Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me. In it was a scroll, which he unrolled before me on both sides, like I said earlier, were written words of lament, of mourning, and of woe. And chapter three, and he said to me, son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat, <laughs> right? And then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. And then he said to me, son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. You are not to be, you are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel, not to many peoples, pay close attention to that part, but not to many peoples of obscure speech and difficult language whose words you cannot understand. Surely if I had sent you to them, they would have listened to you, right? So pretty much very similar experiences here. <laughs> Ezekiel is given a scroll, he chumps down on it, he eats it, and uh, you know, based on the command that was given to him, John is given the same command. The only difference here is the scroll in John's case, it's sweet to his mouth, but it doesn't sit well in his stomach. <laughs> That's well, 
you know, John is experiencing this. He's the Bible, he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. So whether it's literal, whether it's a vision, we don't know. Uh, but he's experiencing this for sure. Uh, he says it's sweet in my mouth. So he's having a sweet taste in his mouth, but he's having an upset stomach. And there is no, <laughs> there's nothing spiritual about an upset stomach, right? I mean, he's actually experiencing this, right? So the question here, what is the meaning of this, right? Well, the sweet taste in the mouth is often associated with the word of God. Right. We can see in many passages, for example, in the Psalms and other places where it talks about the sweetness of the word of God. Right. Uh, in Psalm 119, verse uh, 103, he says, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Right. And there are many other places. Again, we don't have time, unfortunately, but you can read it. Psalm 19, Proverbs talks about the sweetness of the word of God. Right the sweetness of the word of God to us, <laughs> right? Right? So the word of God is sweet, right? We must, we, must, we must take it in, right? And I was thinking that eating the scroll is a way of, you know, suggesting that the prophet should ingest <laughs> and also assimilate <laughs> the message, the word of God into himself. Uh, right? That's what that is saying in that context, right? You know, and Ezekiel, when you get to verse 7, if I have that, it says, but the people of Israel are not willing to listen to you because they're not willing to listen to me and all this. And he said, I'll make you a deal unyielding and a part of them they are. Yeah. So it kind of becomes sour there too. I guess in a sense, yeah. I guess you might say it does kind of become sour. But in a sense, you know, so we'll talk about, you know, the sourness and the sweetness or the bitterness, you might say, of, of in this case of the word versus the sweetness here in a second. But in another well-known passage we see in Jeremiah that's very similar, in Jeremiah 15, 16, it says, when your words came, this is Jeremiah speaking, I ate them. <laughs> right? Jeremiah says, they were my joy and my heart's delight. So it's a, essentially the question is the word of God your joy? Is the word of God your heart's delight, right? You remember what Jesus said to the devil? You know, he quoted the scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, the, the word of God is meat to our souls, <laughs> right? It is bread indeed to us. We want to consume it, consume the word of God. It will be sweet in your mouth, <laughs> But sometimes it might be bitter as well, right? As you see there. So like Ezekiel's scroll, the immediate result of eating that scroll, it's a sweet taste, but he begins to experience this bitterness, right? In his mouth, right? Excuse me, in his stomach. And so again, the, prop, the, the, the point here probably to the point in terms of the message content is again, is, is, is in reference to the upcoming trials, the upcoming tribulation. The word of God is sweet in the sense that God is going to vindicate his people. He's going to come to the defense of his people. He will protect those who are sealed. It is sweet, but there's going to come a time of trial and tribulation in the church. And that part is bitter. Right. So that's kind of the way I see it there. So the command to devour the book is not simply like you know, a figurative way of saying digest it mentally. <laughs> right. Again, in John's case, it led to this real act. Again, it, again, we don't know how he's experiencing this. If it's just purely a visionary thing. Right. Just a visionary experience. Right. Or not. But in this case, he's been asked to, to, to consume it. And so John has been asked to assimilate the content of the scroll into himself so that he can be, he can assimilate, he can ingest it, it can become part of him, right? And then he can speak it out, right? So the, 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 the message is such a powerful one. But also the identity of this scroll has been discussed, as you might imagine, quite extensively. Um, and so they've been, oh, what is the meaning of this scroll? And some have said, well, maybe the scroll, yes, it is the word of God. The scroll is the word of God. It is the gospel, right? Others see it as a general message of woe that is to come. 
Others still find it it's in its content, the first 13 verses uh, of uh, chapter 11, which we're going to be do dealing with next, starting next week. We're going to start getting into uh, chapter 11, and some see that. In fact, that's kind of where I take it myself, that yes, it, yes, it, it could be the word of God, and that is true, uh, but I think in this case, it's what's the message that is to come, the immediate message of trial and tribulation that is to come. And so the, the answer to the identity of this little scroll is to a considerable extent, again, tied up with the interpretation of it being sweet as honey in the mouth, but it turns the stomach sour. Right. And so that is usually held to be sweet because it is a word from God and the word of God is always sweet, but it turns the stomach sour because of the tribulations that is to come. Right. And so it seems more plausible, in my opinion, right, that the little scroll is a message for the believing church. Right. Uh, that is, again, like you see in, 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 in the passage to come in chapter 11, that trials and, and tribulations are coming. That's the message of the little scroll, <laughs> All right? So anyway, we go on to verse 11. So now John is told that he must prophesy. He must prophesy about many peoples, uh, nations, languages, and kings. Now let's just quickly go back to, just a, again, quick reference here back to Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel chapter uh, two. Uh, you remember where Ezekiel is told in uh, verse six, he says, but not to many peoples of obscure speech and difficult language whose words you cannot understand, right? And actually, let me back up a little bit to verse five. He says, you are not being sent to a people of obscure speech and difficult language, but to the house of Israel, right? But now John is being told, you will in fact prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. You see the difference there, right? So in a sense, both of them are very similar, but quite, but different as, as well, right? In the sense that John, like Ezekiel, is being sent to the, um, the, the spiritual Israel. He's being sent to the church. The church is spiritual Israel. So just like Ezekiel was sent to prophesy to the household of faith, the household of Israel, right? John is also being sent to prophesy to the household of faith. Right. The only difference here is, but he is going to prophesy about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Right. And so, if we are correct, again, like I said, in terms of the interpretation here of the little scroll as a message uh, to the believers about to enter the final persecution, right? Then this renewed commission of prophecy relates to the prophecies that are about to come. Right, that we will see when the seventh trumpet is blown in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. Right, and then the fourfold classification of peoples, nations, languages, tribes, and so on. Of course, that is very much an, a reoccurring theme in Revelation. In fact, it occurs five times in Revelation. The only difference here is that tribes has been replaced with kings, right. Um, and that's probably a suggestion that God's word is going to go through the prophets to all those, even those in the highest authority, <laughs> right? So no one is going to be exempt, right, uh, from God's word in this case. Uh, and so in any case here, what we see here is the word of God is going to go out, right? The prophecies will deal with people of all races, right? Of all, it will, it will, you know, the, in it, it's going to go out to all people in general without attention to any racial, geographic, ethnic, social distinction. It's going to go out to all people. The only distinction, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be made in the last days is between those who have the seal of God and those who have the mark of the beast. <laughs> right? Lord, help us that we would be sealed by God, that we will have the seal of God and not the mark of the beast, right? Because that's what that's the only difference <laughs> that we're going to see. All right, so that pretty much wraps it up. And I wanted to, to end by looking at how do we apply all this to ourselves? <laughs> what is the contemporary significance of all of these uh, things uh, for us? Well, I think this passage obviously provides several lessons uh, that we can glean 
from it to be contextualized for us uh, in terms of our own circumstances and, and our own lives, right? So I just want to quickly point out um, five things that I think this text uh, teaches us, right? The first one is the awesomeness of the angel obedient uh, to God and what that implies. It implies that God rules all things, <laughs> even the supernatural forces, the forces of good and the forces of evil. All right? Now, if we, even if we go back to the previous chapter, verse, chapter 9, you remember God is the one who orders even the, angel, the demons that are, the, 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 the evil angels that are bound up. <laughs> they are under his control, <laughs> in a sense. Right, So this is the first thing that we need to understand here. No matter what, that all God rules all superhuman and supernatural forces. So the, the bottom line here is, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, we need not fear. We need not fear because they are under his control. So whatever crises we as individuals or as God's people experience, as a whole or in the individually, right? We must be comforted. We can take courage in that constant reminder in the Bible that God has everything under his control, no matter what, <laughs> right? So that's the first lesson we can learn from that. Lesson number two, the thunders. You remember the thunders that I mentioned at the beginning? The thunders that we're about to speak and you know, it says, nope, don't write them down. Don't write. So we don't know what the thunders said. The thunders, I think, reveal that some matters are not yet ours to know. <laughs> you know, like I said, the apocalyptic question is, when will the end come? What will happen? Everybody has these questions. But the hidden things belong to God alone. <laughs> he alone knows until Jesus returns. We can only know in part. You remember what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13? I know in part, right? As of now, we look through a mirror darkly, <laughs> right? We're looking through a mirror darkly. But when he is revealed, we shall know all things, right? But now we're just, you know, trying to figure things out. So, the, the, you know, one of the frustrations people always have when we do a study like this in Revelation is people will say, well, you know, you didn't answer all my questions. You didn't answer all my questions. You didn't tell me about what this means or what that means. Because I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to make it up. Right? I don't know. The best we can do sometimes is speculate, but there are certain things that are still hidden, right? And so this does not mean that we shouldn't seek knowledge or that we shouldn't, you know, want to know more. It, it does mean, though, that God has set the boundaries of what is the best for us to know. Right, and we should acknowledge those boundaries, <laughs> right? And we should work within those boundaries. In other words, we should avoid too much undue speculation <laughs> about what things mean and what things don't mean, and so on, right? Because we cannot be certain, we cannot know what certain things will mean. Oops, sorry, <laughs> right? We cannot be certain about what certain things will mean, and so we should avoid. And this is the key here, ladies and gentlemen, we should avoid being too dogmatic, <laughs> right? Some people get so dogmatic about revelation. Oh, this is, you know, this is when this is going to take place. And this is, you know, remember, you know the tribulation is this thing. And this, 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 this. It's like, yes, we, we, at the end of the day, we don't know. <laughs> we, <laughs> exactly. You know, you only sometimes turn on Christian television, you turn on these prophetic you know, teachers, and they're telling you this is what this means and this is what that means. and da, da, da. They're only speculating, ladies and gentlemen. They don't know. They don't know, right? And so we must be very careful to not be dogmatic about certain things because, again, there are certain things that are, again, hidden from us, right? And that's just the way it is, right? Um, and so, again, in contrast, again, like I said, to these uh, prophetic teachers that you know that are like that we shouldn't do that right god rules the future right but we do not need to know the details sometimes right he has not guaranteed us that kind of knowledge especially about the final details before the delay 
quote unquote, the delay is over, right? The seven thunders can may constitute one of the most important words, I think, to these prophecy teachers, <laughs> because it says, shh. Essentially, that's what <laughs> it says in Revelation to John. The seven thunders speak, and John is about to write down what they say, and the voice says, shh, don't write it down. Keep it secret. Keep it to yourself, right? So in contrast, like I said, to, to, to this principle, some of these prophecy teachers, they fill in too many of the details that they don't really know, that the text doesn't say, and they try to kind of, you know, figure it out, right? And of course, we have what I call these prognosticators, these <laughs> fortune tellers, future tellers, whatever you want to call them, right? I think sometimes, yes, they satisfy our curiosity because we all want to know what's going to happen about the future. But my job, and I consider myself a biblical expositor, meaning I just explain the text as best as I can and, and try to you know, teach and preach the text. My job is to help you hear the word of God and obey it. Right? And that's my job. And that is why, you know, when I say I'm going to teach Revelation, well, sometimes, maybe sometimes people are disappointed in the way I've taught Revelation. I don't know. Maybe they were expecting, you know, um, you know, what is it called now? You know, left behind or something like that. <laughs> you know, that's not what you're going to get because the message, the message of scripture speaks for itself and it's not my job to add to it. Right? Number three. Um, the, the third thing that I see here is the promise of no delay. Uh, I think this reminds us that though we wait and we are in a, we're like in a holding pattern right now, right? We're in a holding pattern. We're waiting. We're waiting right now for the fulfillment of all things, right? That delay will not last forever. Amen. That delay will not last forever. A time is coming when God will fulfill his promises that he has made throughout history. It is coming, right? In fact, there was a minister that said, a, a, a Methodist minister by the name of Joseph Charles Price that said, uh, no matter how dark the night, I believe in the coming of the dawn, <laughs> right? As surely as the sun rises uh, in the east, God will fulfill his promises. A time is coming when these things will come to fruition. So we can take that to heart. No matter how long the delay, Jesus will return. He will come back, right? He will keep his promises. Number four, we should follow John's example by obeying, right? Obeying even when the message doesn't always seem pleasant, <laughs> Right? When the message that we are called to proclaim is sometimes bitter. The problem with the church today is that, and, and I don't, you know, I don't want to harp on some Christians and some churches, but some churches feel like they don't want to preach a hard gospel. They want everything to be, you know, um, what's a nice way of putting it? They want everything to be you know, cushy and sweet and pleasant and, you know, lovey-dovey and, you know, whatever. And there is nothing wrong with that in the sense that God loves us. But not all of it is just lovey-dovey and, you know, and, you know, hugs and cuddles. <laughs> the Bible is not a book of hugs and cuddles all the time. Yes, God loves us. He hugs us. He, he's compassionate. He's merciful. But there are times when God has a hard message for us. Repent, he calls out to us. Turn away from, you know, so all of these. So yes, there are times when the message is bitter. But we must preach it anyway. You see, I think sometimes, you know, some Christian circles, especially like in the prosperity gospel crowd. <laughs> again, I'm not trying to, you know, be, you know, down on them. But, you know, I think to some degree they do their, their, their members a disservice. Because what they do is they just tell them all the, you know, God wants you to prosper. God wants you, God, you know, God is going to give you a Mercedes Benz and a build your house. And, and look, God can do all of those things. Absolutely. But that's not all. <laughs> right. Because the Bible talks about times of trials and persecutions and, and sufferings. And so we, we have to be balanced in our message. God wants to bless us. Yeah, somebody says, God wants to bless your socks off. <laughs> he wants to bless you beyond more than you can contain, right? But that doesn't mean times of trials and tribulations will not come. 
right? So we have to be balanced in that sense. Sometimes the message is pleasant. It's sweet in our mouth. Other times it's not so sweet. But God will give us the grace if we're obedient, right? And then lastly, I think the message of Revelation concerns many peoples. No one is exempt from the warnings, right? Those that are most inclined, I think, to, to cozy up, hear me, all of, all of us, if we are inclined to cozy up to the current morals of our society, the current lifestyles and the current mentality of the world, be warned, take heed, because a time of judgment will come. The cup of judgment will come to all people, right? Regardless of whoever you are, regardless of race, regardless of whatever, ethnicity, geography, no matter what. So it's a, so the message is, it's a prophecy. The word in his mouth is a message to all peoples, tribes, nations, languages, everybody. And it's also, it's a message of suffering for believers. A time of suffering will come, all right? So let us take heart that God is with us, that he will keep us even during that time of suffering. Amen. Next week, we'll go into chapter 11. Let's go to, to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. Indeed, it is sweet. It is sweet as honey. And Lord, we want to live on it. We want it to be bread to us. We want it to be meat to us. We want it to sustain us. And so we want to consume it and make it, make it a part of us. But Lord, we know that there are also times when it will be bitter. And Lord, help us in those times. When those times of bitterness come, the times of trials, the times of persecution, the time of suffering. When it comes, Lord, give us grace. Give us grace to make it through, to sustain us during those times until you come back again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you, everyone. Thanks for coming out. We'll see you all next week.